Good evening. Welcome to the 5-8, where we discuss each of the week's five most fucked up topics for eight minutes. Five talks, eight minutes, two hosts, a guest, some singing, a lot of curse words, and as many cocktails as we deem necessary. LB, we made it to 2024. We made <laughs> just barely, it feels like. I feel like I'm eking into the new year. Yeah. I'd like a little bit more rest, but I'm 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 actually I'm I'm up for it. I think it's gonna be as we as we did in our last show, we reviewed. We're gonna have, I think, a lot of some big things happen this year. There's gonna be some tumbling around. It's gonna feel like we're in a dryer on hyperspeed with like an old shoe and some wet towels that never okay. get dry. But um I think we I think we will make it out alive. How are you? Where are you? That is a different background. I am at an undisclosed uh, location, which may or may not be um, in front of the second largest convention center in North America, uh, possibly yeah. in a state run by um, Ron. Quite possibly. Could be. Quite possibly. Could be. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah, it could be. I'm not, I'm not going to say for sure, but I am in a hotel. I paid for the extra internet. I sprung for the high speed. Oh, thank you. And so I'm much. broadcasting at not high def, at like regular def. So hopefully it'll be okay. So I'm going to apologize in advance if it's not. Well, um, if you freeze up, then I'll 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 do my best. We'll just. Yeah, I, I think it'll be okay. I we'll get through better. it. We'll get knock, through. Knock wood. Knock wood. Um, a couple things I want to hit up front. Yeah. I don't know if you saw Wayne Lapierre, long yep. time, long time president of the uh, of the NRA. Yeah. Has announced that he is going to retire. Um, congratulations to him. Uh, he was supposed to retire last year, but if he held out for his 500th um, death in a school shooting, he got the extra benefits package. So congratulations, Ray um, LaPierre. Yeah, um, I can't, may you I burn can't. in hell. Yeah, may you burn in hell. Yeah. Horrible, horrible human. One of the worst people that ever mm -hmm. uh, walked face. The um, and then something else I think it lost in the shuffle. Um, I know you don't like when I spring games on you. Oh. But I'm going to spring. It's a very short game. Don't worry. Okay, you this say that every time. No, this one's really short. We have a great okay. guest. We don't want to keep him waiting. Okay. All right. Uh, the game is um, Bob Menendez. Who is he not spying for? That's it. That's the game. I'm going to say a name of a country. You tell me, yes, he's spying for that country. No. Okay. I'm not, I'm not all that up on it, but let's Alleged. Go. Alleged. Alleged. Let's be clear. Alleged. Alleged. Gold bars in the closet. You know, they're just there because of Cuba or something. Okay. Uh, first country, Egypt. Yes. Yes. I don't have the little thing to ding because I'm not at my house. Ding. ding, ding. Okay. Yes. Uh, second country, Qatar. I'm going to say yes because You're correct. everybody does. Yeah. That came out <laughs> this week. I, I spent that came a out lot of week. money. Oh, I missed it. Okay. Yeah, I know. I know. It's another right, I'm taking a wild shot. Another but... country he's spying for. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Cuba. I'm going to say yes on Cuba. Yeah, the answer is we don't know, but I'm not willing to rule it out. I think that's it. Yeah, so, I'm uh, going to say yes. That that's um, a, It's a nice little cluster he's got. Yeah, it's good. It's, it's the good D list. Him. That's the end of the game. You win. You did great. There are Thank no parting you. gifts. I'm sorry Thank to say. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I might put them on so. the C list. I might put some of them. Egypt's definitely the D list. Yeah. Mm. D list for what? Just of like places that you could take money from that will pay you when there's lots, there's lots going on, there's lots available to you. So, yeah, yeah. you know, I don't know who's next for him, but go high to the pyramids, pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. All right, um, <laughs> we're gonna have an after hours today. We, we are. We are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll yeah. try to hang. We'll try to hang in there for everybody, and we hope you hang in there for us. So. Yeah. If you don't know what that is, if you're new to us, there's a, and you look on your YouTube screen, there's a join little feature. You can button, whatever we want to call it. So you can hit join. It's right by subscribe. And um, it's just a little bit of a monthly pay of $1.99 at the low threshold, or you can be very generous and, and choose something else. We keep it very low because we just, it's just a way to have a, a close community and a nice conversation. We kind of let our hair down. It's just a little bit different. Um, so if you go ahead and join, then you're automatically allowed into um, the, I guess our, our inner VIP room in our clubhouse. Yeah. Um, 
and Greg has a link that he puts up. So that's all available to you. And if you look here in the comments, usually um, our great moderator, True Player, will put it up as well. So and she already she already did. But it's it lives great. in the it's it's very easy to see. I think it's very easy to see, and we'd love to have you. Yeah. Thank you everybody for uh, for you. joining and keeping keeping the lights on, even though you know pretty dark in this room. It's okay. So dark in that room. <laughs> Uh, well, I, the lighting is weird. I don't know. I, I was trying to do my best. This, All right, my, so it's my computer is on a garbage can right now. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. yeah perfect. Hotel room yeah. setups are it's always a nice setup. big square garbage can that had two. It's perfect for this. I perfect. actually, I feel like I'm to bring it home with me. It's you so might. Cool. It, it's yeah. a good height. Mm -hmm. So it's me and a sausage party, right? I've got you and five dudes. You got me and five dudes six five dudes, dudes actually six dudes another one on the yeah. way yeah. yeah all right yeah. all right I love all right let's get party. let's get rolling uh the first dude is uh is ben yeah our first topic let me do my one job that i'm always uh, late to do and get this going so i wanted to talk about we we kind of i don't know maybe we all wanted to talk about this but <clears throat> the more reporting came out around october 7th it was in New York Times. It's a whole bunch of reporters out in Goldman, blah, 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 did. Uh, and I'm not a fan of the Times, as everybody knows, but this this was very, you know, when they do that collaborative reporting, it's usually very well done. Yeah. And this was very well done. So I encourage everybody, again, to read a piece. Um, and that's the headline is, where was the military? So it's this question that you kind of know to ask it if you don't know anything about if you've never served in the armed forces or you don't know anything about how sort of nation states you know preparedness or maybe not a first responder you might not it, it's sort of a new world it's like how we have to learn about the courts now we have to learn about all this stuff now just to be just to understand what's happening in the world we have to develop these expertise sets um but uh i think even for someone who's like me, I've never served in anything or anything. I just was like, where are they? You know, where were they on October 7th? Where was the Israeli military? This is one of the supposedly most polished mil and, and tr heavily trained and ready and prepared um, and skilled militaries on the planet. And they were nowhere to be found for eight hours while the attacks were happening, um, especially in the music festival. And now we have, you know, last time we talked about the gruesomeness of, of the reporting around all of that. And so I'm, this report comes out in the New York Times. It talks about what happened. And I just want to go through some data points of that and then shift to how uh, I'm, I've actually fallen in love with Mika Brzezinski. <laughs> was it's not that I wasn't a fan before or whatever I mean she's fine it's cable news it's pundits whatever but she is on this and she's on it in a way that she's sort of keeping the conversation from collapsing in and on itself from everybody whose heads are spinning and they don't want to just say the thing that's on the table and they don't want to call out all of the evil they just are making excuses out of thin air for stuff that doesn't make any sense um, and trying to apply it. And so I, I so appreciated her this week because she was like, no, 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 no. And kept separating it even with her, her friends that are on her show with her that are experts in their little area. Everyone has their little expertise. As I said, we rely on them as pundits to inform us and their brains are like separating from, from inside their heads and floating away because they can't come out and call this thing what it is. So here was the reporting. Some of this you guys may have known. Um, some of it was new to me. So two days, so that would be October 5th, right? Two days before the uh, uh, Hamas attack, a hundred forces were moved, relocated. Now we knew that. We knew forces had been relocated out of the area where Hamas just sort of waltzed on in. <laughs> Um, and we also, this is, you know, kind of goes on the heels of the reporting that the women, uh, IDF soldiers who are monitoring that part of the border and were picking up signals and picking up intelligence and also seeing what was going on, were informing up their chain of command, which would go up into the top of military intelligence and over to, uh, this, this was military intelligence, not 
soldiers um, up to Bibi and the cabinet and the and the generals and his leaders that there's an attack coming, there's an attack coming, there's an attack coming, and they weren't listening to these women uh, who were picking up the signals and and knew what was what was going on, um, and we don't know why they weren't. <laughs> you know, again, this is where punditry comes in and makes up excuses and, well, they just couldn't imagine and, oh, they just could it just seemed, at his, I don't know, his, his, histrionic. Did it seem hysterical? Were these women being hysterical by saying, no, there's going to be a few thousand Hamas coming in here. They're coming. So not only were they not listened to, not only were all these calls not heeded, not only do we also know that allies we're also informing we're picking up signals we know something's going to happen you're going to have an attack you're going to have an attack you're going to have an attack and for whatever reason like our 911 it was just ignored but another step further went to like well let's move our defense forces away from the area where the attack is going to happen and they were you know these are it's not like Israel saying, this is where we moved our forces. Nobody, no military does that. This is where our defense forces are being moved and our special forces are being moved. But wherever they were moved to, somehow, this is also came into the reporting, Hamas knew what roads to block off so that they could not, by road, get to where the music festival was and the other sort of strip of land and the, and the, uh, uh, kibbutz where, where the attacks were go going going to go down. So somehow Hamas knew exactly Hamas. We're talking about Hamas now. Hamas, the tunnel diggers, knew where to put roadblocks and block the roads. So where was the military? They were stuck in traffic for eight hours on the day. Well, now there's second traffic that's happening. We know that Hamas parachuted into that, that, uh, that music festival. So they had control of the airspace. What happened to Israel's control of its own airspace? And where were the helicopters? Where, why weren't soldiers or defense forces or some, somebody, anybody lift airlifted into the area? And this reporting uh, reports that that question was asked and the resp official response from Bibi and his generals and the whole thing was, now's not the time to look into that. Now's not time. We don't, we don't have an answer for that. We don't know. And now's not the time to investigate it because we're in the middle of a war. So when the war is over, then we'll take a look at that. But right now we're at war. Everyone should just absorb that as much as possible. I mean, it, I... okay. I mean, Egypt, so, knew. Egypt knew, which Egypt means knew. Bob Menendez knew. Which probably. means Bob Menendez knew. Uh, we're not trying to make a lot of this. It's very serious, but it's, uh, it's, it's overwhelming. So then the reporting goes on to say, okay, the, the defense forces that were trying to get there and were stuck in traffic <laughs> We're communicating, not with up the chain of command, not with, weren't getting things come down to them, say, go here, go there. They were on social media with one another and on WhatsApp going and looking at social media from the music. Like, are they there? Are they there? Where's Hamas? Where's Hamas? Meanwhile, some of them were asleep in their bunkers and in came Hamas in knowing exactly where they were to come in to their, right? So they're like literally sleeping. Oh, there's Hamas. This is, the IDF, everybody. I just want to. I want you to imagine that happening to our to our soldiers on our bases or in secret locations, right? And that they're having. They don't have. They're not getting commands for eight hours. They're DMing one another, going, "What the fuck? Where do we go? How do we figure this out?" Because as it turns out, there was no playbook or training that any of them had had, at least recently, on how to respond to a mass terror attack, living in a nation that is being threatened for, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 years of a mass terror attack happening any minute. 
by everybody around. So what Mika did and that I want us all to keep doing is not allowing the folks that come in and say, wait, wait, you're not experts. We're experts in this, right? And that's fine. We'll give them that space and that grace. But when they start to collapse things, things get collapsed like, well, they just couldn't uh, you know, conceive that Hamas could do this. Well, that's very different than how they responded on the day, in the moment, while their women were being raped and butchered and cut into pieces. While children were being executed and tortured after watching their parents get executed and tortured around the kitchen table and then their bodies dismembered or burned. So I encourage everybody to go read that New York Times article. I'm a little bit out of time and I encourage everybody to not let anyone that you're watching, you see it on social media, do not let people get away with putting it all in a bucket of lack of imagination or a failure that we can't address right now. Because what's happening right now is we're aiding them, aiding BBs who's, you know, had he, the guy who funded Hamas, remember that reporting too, um, to just slaughter Palestinians and demolish uh, civilians in their homes, in their places of work, just make Gaza unrecognizable. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's uh, that's well said. I'm just going to add very quickly. Yeah. He's incentivized to continue the war. That's the first thing. That's right. Because he thinks he's going to stay there until the war is over. So why on earth is he ever going to end the war? And, uh, that, that's the first thing. Uh, the second wait. thing is that he wants the Palestinians gone. This has been clear. He went to, he gave a speech, the, Bibi gave a speech at the UN showing a map of Israel with no more Gaza, right? So this is something that he wants. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as long as he is still uh, in power there, um, you know, no, no peace is going gonna, is gonna to come out of it. So that's what I... Expect. And here's the failure of imagination. The failure of the imagination is for the international community to grasp that perhaps this sociopath, this man, right, rose to power like many other psychopaths have, right, and would be willing to do anything that to keep his power, especially when for month after month before this attack happened, there were hundreds of thousands of Israelis out in the street peacefully demonstrating for his removal. Yeah. So I don't want to hear about, you know, lack of imagination or that when you can just look at the history books and there's example after example after example of strong men doing shit just like this to stay in power where they are when they're at moments of being vulnerable and engaging in this. And that's what Mika was also going for is like, there's something nefarious going on here. Yeah. Yeah. That's complicated. It's, it's, you know, Biden's in a very delicate position. Okay. It's we should move on. Delicate we position. Move on. We're we don't want to keep on. our guests waiting. We're moving on. Uh, hey, Al, not AI. Al. Al. Um, okay. So I'm going to try to make this quick. Uh, my son, my my oldest, is sort of he's interested in the Epstein stuff because the list that's come out because he thinks hip hop guys are going to be on it. And he oh. wants to make sure and check to see that his favorite hip hop artists are not on the list. That's what okay. So uh, when this thing came out yesterday, the day before, whatever it was, this week, late this week, I sent him the link and he looked at it and he texted me the guy who's mentioned the Alan Dershowitz, but I don't know who that is. So that's what he that's what my son said, not knowing who he spelled it right and everything. Um, so there's that. The link here is that BB has asked Alan Dershowitz to represent Israel, him and Israel, the government of Israel, at the ICC, the yeah. International Community. So that's the that's the direct tie-in here. Yeah. Um, I th this guy, I want to just go through his career because it's very odd to me. I I don't I know that you know everybody deserves to have representation, but you know, here chronologically, 1984. Alan Dershowitz successfully defends Klaus von Bülow 
uh, gets out of that, the, 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 on the appeal. Okay. That's what kind of makes his name. Uh, 1992, he shows up when Woody Allen ran the op on Mia Farrow, he shows up and starts talking as if he is Mia Farrow's attorney. Mm -hmm. Um, he's referenced in the reporting as Mia Farrow's attorney. As it turns out, he is not in fact Mia Farrow's attorney because Mia Farrow never <laughs> employed him. Family never actually yeah. did him. Uh, this I know, uh, for sure. So, uh, 1993 represents Mike Tyson, 1994, Jim Baker, 1995, O.J. Simpson, 1997, uh, he writes an op-ed kind of out of nowhere talking about how the age of consent is meaningless and we should maybe revisit it. And 15 is a good number. Why? Who knows? Uh, then there's a little break in the action. 2008, he negotiates the Epstein deal with uh, the government to get you know, complete getting off lightly. 2011. Well, it's not just that. It was the, no, it, no one else that was named. They're all immune. Right. right. Yeah. Right. The immunity. And it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a great deal for them. Yeah. For uh, him. 2011, Julian Assange, 2018, Harvey Weinstein, 2019 writes a book called the association, the challenge of proving innocence in the age of me too. Uh, 2020 he's Trump's attorney. Uh, at the, uh, the impeachment. Um, 2021, he gets Bandy Lee fired from Yale. And uh, 2024, here he is. He's going to go represent Israel in the thing. Now, uh, the thing that bothers me about him, and I get it. I get that he's a defense attorney and he's a, he likes the spotlight. He wants to be famous. He wants to be the best, whatever. Okay. Yeah. There's a difference between defending someone and befriending someone. You can defend a horrible person. Why the fuck are you hanging out with them? Why are you friends with Jeffrey Epstein, Alan Dershowitz, comma, who knows everything that he did? Because if anyone knows everything that he did, it's his fucking defense lawyer, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, prior to all this, after Here Von Bulow, but before everything else will be, Here we go. Alan Dershowitz represents Jonathan Pollard. That's who right. is Jonathan Pollard? Tell us. Jonathan Pollard is was sort of the biggest and is a rare, he's a rare uh, conviction for the U.S. Department of Justice in that he was an Israeli spy. Now, and we caught him spying for Israel, selling secrets, a uh, couple yeah, to South Africa. And like some an actual places. Israeli spy. Yeah, an actual Israeli spy, an actual Israeli spy. And... Uh, his and he was recently uh i think trump allowed him to go back or someone allowed him to go back to israel finally he got out and he went back yeah um and bb really wanted him and there was a big celebration that this guy's back but we don't normally go after our allies spies imagine like we caught a british spy spying for like we would just like oh yeah we know that british spy because we work with him and he helps us and yeah normally it's like that so if you're if you're prosecuting and convicting and incarcerating and a spy of one of our allies, right? Because he was spying on America for our ally and doing really crooked stuff. And now we have to go to court with our ally, right? In a counterintelligence investigation that explodes into criminal court. And this guy's going away because we need to put him in a hole because we didn't know. He thought he was, and he was working in intelligence on art, right? We thought he was someone for us. And it turns out he was doing all this for Israel. So it caused a lot of strife and a lot of, it, very tricky, very delicate. Now, what I want everybody to do is imagine you're head of Israeli military intelligence, <laughs> Right. And they've got many, many divisions over there, um, just like we do uh, many, many agencies. So imagine you're like all the way at the chain or even the prime minister. And you're like, oh, shit, they got him. Right. Are you going to go? Well, you know what? Let's see what happens. I mean, he'll just have to find his own attorney um, who will then know all of our, all of what we've been up to behind our allies' backs. And they've got, you know, they know it's bad enough that they, they're they going to throw one of our guys into prison. Um, but, you know, maybe he'll find someone in the phone book that'll represent him or 
Are you going to do that? You got to Anna, put yourself in the shoes of the other guy and say, what, what would you do if this was your spot and you weren't supposed to have him in there and the guy, and they, Oh my God, he got fucking caught. And he knows all this shit. He knows what we wanted him to do. He knows what we sent him in there. He knows what the, what we're like, he probably knows the other spies that are in there that would you, <laughs> would you just let him pick an attorney or would you make sure you put your own motherfucker on him? That's the, I don't know. I, don't I know. just want everybody to do that mental exercise. I don't know. I would call legal aid. Legal aid. Has would you yeah. call legal aid? Yeah. Yeah. Friend yeah. of mine worked for legal aid. It was, it was yeah. Funny. It'll all work out. Um, anyway, I just, Dershowitz is going to be in the news a lot, I think, as this, as this moves along. So, okay. Let's move on. Okay. Um, all right. Let's move on. Did we? Are, did you? Yeah, you're under time. Yeah, I, I want to be under time. We're trying to. We're trying to. It's like you know that my flight was late, and the pilot was chugging along trying to get us there uh, on time anyway. You know, and all uh, right. and, and that's what it was. Um, and we want to get to I'm our guests. To say, we do have a new sponsor, don't we? Have we a do, new. We have a new sponsor. New, uh, new gee, who, is, who is it? I don't know. Let's see. Did you take a ride on a private jet named after a book by Nabokov? Have you visited a virgin island populated by actual virgins? Are you an intimate associate of a financier who didn't actually work in finance? I know what that's like, because it happened to my kid sister, Ghislaine. Hi, I'm Maxine Maxwell, Esquire, president of Max Max Legal Services. Whether you're a former president, a movie star, a tech geek, British royalty, or just a random Harvard man, Max Max can help. It doesn't matter if you were his constant companion or even if you kept your underwear on the whole time. No one wants to be associated with the world's most notorious sex trafficker. Take it from a member of the Maxwell family. This is an A-list you don't want to be on. Come in today for a free consultation. Tell us every single thing you did, and we'll make sure no one ever finds out. Max Max, your secrets are safe with us. And now, back to the show. Uh, wow. I, incredible ad. Incredible ad for that service. Wow. I, uh, All right. Shout out to the sweet grandma from New York who walked in <laughs> as I was trying to record that and I couldn't get the voice quite right. And she just, this is my mom, she just riffed that whole audio. I'd never seen anything like it with the fake yeah. slurring and the whole thing. It just was, it was something else. So shout out Excellent to- uh, Shout out to Barbara. Shout out to Barbara. Excellent job. Um, okay. We've waited long enough. Are you frozen? Am I frozen or are you frozen? I'm not frozen. No? I don't think you're frozen. Okay. I well, think you well, have bad, I think you have bad internet, but you look fine to me. Okay, fine. Here we go. I think everything's fine now. Our guest is the former chief counsel for Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, and he's now the executive director of a nonprofit called court. Accountability, Alex Aronson. Welcome back. Alex hey, hey, thanks for having me. Great to see you both. How so are you? Good to see you. And here I was thinking that uh, podcast ad uh, advertising was drying up. Look at you guys <laughs> bringing in the sponsor. Right? There's a lot of money there, too. That's, There's a that's lot a of money one. with those yeah. Maxwells. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? Oh, how funny. Well, Happy New Year. It's wonderful happy New to Year. see you. Okay. Um, we were saying before, uh, as we started, we were letting everybody that watched us on our, our New Year's countdown or end of year countdown, I think it was maybe the hot Christmas one, um, that we had uh, foretold that 2024, we were going to have a lot happening in the courts. So we wanted to get you in right at the top of the year and have you download us and, and uh, get us up to date on what's going on right now. And also maybe give us some projections of like, or just what you know we're going to see because there's scheduled court uh, things happening on the docket. So we're so thrilled you're here and you can fill us in. That sounds great. Yeah, it's the uh, the court I think right now is feeling like the, the dog that caught the car. It's got quite a lot on its hands right now. 
<laughs> so we should start with this with the abortion ruling that happened because that's coming. Mm -hmm. um, this this Fifth Circuit thing. They're like, you know what? It's okay that women should die because Constitution, because a bunch of slaveholders said so in in seventeen whatever. So um, tell us, talk a little bit about that. Walk us through what's going to happen and what these cases are that are going to affect uh, women's health in the uh, coming year. Should um, things continue the way they're continuing now? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, big, big abortion um, term for the court now. We, we learned tonight, <clears throat> just a couple hours ago, that the court is going to, to hear a case this term um, around um, the intersection, the conflict between a federal statute that's been around for decades that requires emergency rooms in federally funded hospitals, which is pretty much every hospital, mm -hmm. to provide emergency life-saving services when you know people are have have their lives in jeopardy in those emergency contexts. Uh, a conflict between that long-standing statute and these new abortion bans that have emerged in the wake of Dobbs that have really pr proliferated with the support of the same, you know, right-wing ultra extreme religious interests that, you know, helped bring us Dobbs in the end of Roe and that have been active in the states to help the help state legislatures, red state legislatures, um, devise these really draconian and, and awful abortion bans um, across the red states. So in places like Idaho and Texas, uh, they have these abortion bans that, you know, directly conf conflict with the mandate of that federal statute requiring doctors to provide these life-saving services. And the Ninth Circuit in the, in the first case decided on this question in the Idaho case, um, ruled against the state. They saw pretty clearly that the, the federal statute should preempt the, 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 the state law and that the federal statute was clear. It didn't um, carve out an abortion exception to this requirement that doctors provide these services. But just a couple of days ago, we learned from the Fifth Circuit, the extreme Fifth Circuit that is stacked with uh, Trump and Leo judges, um, that, that they decided the, the case the other way. I think there's a lot of interesting dynamics to the way that the, you know, the, the Federalist Society and Leo really orchestrated the, the packing of these courts to create these dynamics and to allow them to create these conflicts between circuits that justify the court stepping in to resolve these questions. Um, and what the court did tonight is, is really alarming in, in a number of ways. I mean, first, it granted the Idaho case. So um, soon after the Texas decision was issued, Idaho and its state attorney general, who's a part of Leo's network through the Re Republican Attorney General's Association. Raga, yeah. Raga, yeah. They, they rushed to the Supreme Court and asked for a review. They said they were likely to win based on the Fifth Circuit's ruling. And while we, we don't know how the Supreme Court's going to decide this case, one really alarming detail is that they... Um, stayed the, um, the, the lower court um, in the Ninth Circuit, which would have put this in, uh, in pa on, onto pause until, uh, you know, the higher courts reviewed it, which, which effectively means that, you know, in practically speaking, means that all, all of these women in Idaho who are, um, you know, seeking life-saving medical services, um, who are in a, a truly emergency situations in emergency rooms will no longer be able to receive abortion if that is uh, the medically necessary you know, procedure to to save their lives. It's it's really dystopian, and and um, you know, in in a way, it's like Republican death panels all of a sudden. The, the, yeah, the, the imagine that. Cried imagine about that now, around the ACA. and I, you mentioned Leo a couple before you asked the question of it. You, yeah. you mentioned Leo a couple of times. I just oh, want to yeah. say for people unfamiliar, we have Lenny. His name is Leonard Leo. Um, I've written about him extensively. You've talked about him extensively. I like to call him Payoff Lenny. That's why the segment is called Lenny. Uh, so just for people unaware, yeah. Leonard Leo, Google him and my name and read all about him. Okay. Yeah, self-enrichment self Lenny, under investigation by the D.C. Attorney General for his self-enrichment scheme. Ooh, yeah, uh, well, we're, let's get to that, too. We want to talk about that. Yeah, um, yeah. No, I'm just, uh, I think this is sort of like, again, we have kind of across all these dudes, right, and how they do things. Um it's sometimes you can look at these things happening as reactionary. And I think they get reported and covered as if it's just react. Oh, Idaho, this thing protects. So Idaho is going to do this thing. But really this is a, a, a plan um, that has been or architected, right? Okay. This is going to happen in Texas. Then this will happen over here. Then these, this attorney general will be ready to do his thing over there. So what, what we're looking at is like, it can look like a pinball just going willy nilly around it and people are, you know, states are reacting and then the courts reacting. And this is, they know what they're doing. This was a, this was a roadmap of how to get, how to actually topple all this, but make it look like there's not an, a, 
an architect behind it. Um, and there's not a, a playbook behind it of this and then this and then this and then this that probably was crafted. Oh God, out of the, I would say almost originally out of the CNP a long, long time ago. Like these, these attorney generals, these rag, Re, Republican attorney generals association, these guys uh, and women have been put in place specifically to do all of this years before. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think we talked about it the last time I was with you, but yeah, this is the culmination of a really like a 50 year long plan that they, yeah. had, that they hatched, you know, corporate interests really hatched in 1971 with the, the Lewis, the notorious Lewis Powell memo, the attack on American free enterprise, um, which really set in motion this massively funded scheme to um, take over the federal courts, uh, control their composition, and then support um, these, these far right judges with, a huge infrastructure of, you know, intellectual capital through the academy and think tanks, public interest, so-called um, so-called public interest litigating groups that are really fronts for these billionaires that take those ideas and deliver them to the courts where they have now, you know, chosen the judges. And, you know, they're really breaking the law as they move their agenda forward. And one thing that's that's notable, you know, several years into this Trump court is how much of um, their bullshit is, is really like coming to light. Right. And the, the, the ways in which their methodological commitments to, to principles they offered up, like things like originalism or textualism are really just like falling, falling apart under the weight of all this bullshit. And, you know, the Trump case, the other big case that, you know, of course, the court took tonight. Um, they'll be hearing the Colorado case that deemed Trump ineligible to stand on the ballot there. Um, and it's it's sort of a case in point, right? Like if you do an originalist or textualist analysis of the provisions there and look at how the framers of the 14th Amendment were thinking about this situation, it's pretty clearly applicable here. And I think, you know, pretty much everybody expects this court majority to figure out some way to wiggle out of it, which will, I think, again, put the lie to these methodologies that they've promised us, guide them and keep their personal policy preferences out of their their rulemaking, their, their judicial, you know, their judicial opinion making. I have, you know, it, LB, you were saying about the, you know, the scheme. It's a chess game. And the pawns in the chess game are pregnant women who are die. And that's the thing. Like, it's like mothers. There, there are people in Idaho who are going to die because of this. Why can't they just wait until the Supreme Court rules? Up? Because they're going to be dead. That's why. So, you know, it, it, I always think we, we have to kind of revert back to this when we're talking about things, you know, in legalistic terms like this has real world ramifications and, and emergency real world ramifications. But you mentioned the Trump ruling and I don't know what's going to happen because I, I, I can see it working one of today's. Um, the first way is a, a, as what's her name, Alina, uh, what's her name, Haba, mm. yeah. Trump's lawyer uh, said today, like, you know, basically like, hey, that's a nice, uh, nice seat there. You got Brett Kavanaugh. Yeah, she did, didn't she? It. She yeah. basically said, yeah, she basically said so we own him. We own him. Yeah, I think they, I think they can think really count on, they can count on Kavanaugh on this one, right? Like, you know, they've got so much dirt on him that they covered up for yeah. his confirmation. They sort of just own that guy. So Yeah, they I own him. And they said it. They, dirt it. You, yeah. <laughs> they say you now. Who owns yeah. Kavanaugh? Right. But, Trump. We but, answered our article. Finally, Greg. I know. I know. But, okay. So, yes, Trump has these these uh, Supreme Court justices in his, in his hands. But if he really does get reelected and he really does turn the United States into a dictatorship, which he has promised to do. Uh, Only on the first thing that these dictators do is take out the court. So I'm thinking there's also the chance that the Supreme Court justices look at this and, and see that that coming down the line and they're like, fuck this guy. Nobody's taking our power Ooh. away. Because once the you know Supreme Court justice is like a vampire, once they're in the window, once you let them in the window, they can't get rid of them until they see the sunlight or Van Helsing shows up. Van Helsing being impeachment, I suppose. So uh, basically, there's two good reasons to to uh, to do it. One is that Trump just owns them and it's a mafioso situation. The other one is they want to control to have more power. And also, oh, yes, by the way, it's the right thing to do. According to the No, you're projecting again yourself. I'm not projecting. I'm asking. Onto. These people are in a racket together. They're crooks. OK. And he's like, they don't care. 
We'll get to get to this later. You think yeah. they care? I want, I want to hear what Alex has to say about this. You know, I think I think it's not so simple, LB. I mean, I, I think you're largely right. Like, they're all a part of the same project. They're, I think they're largely swimming in the same direction, trying to achieve the same substantive policy outcomes. I do think there's a sense in which, and, and, and so I don't actually think it's a fundamental kind of, um, you know, rift with Trump. I think they they find him kind of like crass and I, I think they don't find him particularly helpful. But I think I think Greg is right, right? At the end of the day, what they care about is um, the preserving their power to continue to to drive their you know in very important in their minds projects forward, you know, regardless of who holds power in the other branches. And if you look at the way they've, you know, wielded their power, it's to con con to agglomerate power, to aggrand aggrandize their own power. And they did that even, you know, when it, you remember Trump had a big case up before them and they smacked him down. Justice Thomas was the lone vote um, seemingly in dissent mm -hmm. um, when the, the court compelled the production of his records, which, you know, that actually came to, to real fruition again this, this week, as we saw um, Representative Raskin reveal that foreign interests were paying millions and millions of dollars to Trump. Oh, yeah, the millions so, of yeah, dollars. We, learned we about forgot that. about that. We learned about that because because <laughs> these these justices, are, all, you know, eight of them, all of them, but but Thomas allowed that to move forward. But, you know, I think what, what's important to evaluate in, in, in their decision to do that was, you know, they, at the end of the day, they're just, uh, you know, seizing more power for themselves to decide these questions, to make themselves the ultimate arbiter of every important question of law, politics and policy in this country. So I, I think they are probably trying to figure out how to walk this tightrope. And my, my guess is that they will, you know, keep him keep him in the election. They will find a way um, without really deciding any of the core constitutional mm -hmm. questions to, co to come up with some excuse to to keep them on the ballot and and hold their nose to to try to keep their their project going well, well let's talk about that project argue that it's not a really that he wasn't responsible for the insurrection they could say we don't have enough proof or whatever That's yeah what you know, they, they, can, yeah. they can do whatever they want they took an yeah. incredibly That's broad and and vague question presented right when the supreme court grants a case this is really interesting actually you know because it's, it, it operates in so many ways not like a court Right. This is a court that can choose which cases it decides. And then it gets to sort of carve up the cases and decide discrete questions within them. And so they actually had a couple of different options here. There were a number of alternative questions presented by um, Colorado and by the, 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 the GOP, the, the Colorado GOP, that were all much more precise and that would have called on them to answer some of these specific constitutional questions. They picked a really vague formulation that gives them a huge amount of leeway to just continue to manipulate this case and to come to whatever conclusion they decide is best for them. It'll be interesting to see which witchcraft law from the 16th century Sam Alito decides to refer back to. Um, yeah. that, that, that's always fun. Uh, I want to I get back to the project, though. So it, let's talk about the project in terms of you know, uh, the abortion thing is clear that, yeah. that women die. Uh, you know, clearly yeah. the, we're going to, uh, you know, there's been, I don't know, for the last 10 years, really strong voices from like Ann Cole, the, the, the think the thought leaders over there that are, or the vomiters that vomit out what Leonard Leo and all the secret people are cooking up. Um, and they just go ahead and float the balloon and see, you know, how how's this land? There's been a t revoking women's right to vote has been uh, literally on their agenda for a while. But what are some of the other, what are some of the things that you can see that this uh, extremist, this sort of religious extremism, I'm sorry, this, uh, the, yeah. Yeah, fundamental, right. which is basically also another mask for just crooks and getting RVs and vacations and God knows how much money so they're stuffing in their pockets. Um, that are going to affect our society. What is what is the project? What yeah. what is it? Yeah. So I mean, when what, you know, um, when when Powell drafted that memo in in the early seventies, and when the Federalist Society really came to life in the during the the Reagan administration, and put a bunch of influential lawyers in the Reagan DOJ, um, they you know they they started to build power and influence. Um, through organizing and coalition building. And, and because this is fundamentally what they're trying to achieve across the, the various factions of that movement are deeply unpopular policies, right? Um, massive deregulation that um, helps the, the wealthiest corporations pollute and ruin our air and water and pre pre prevents government from keeping people safe. 
um, you know, uh, ta giant tax cuts for the for the wealthiest, uh, deeply unpopular kind of so, a, a social agenda and a, 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 ra a racial agenda, right? An anti-democratic racial agenda. Um, and so, you know, with with that unpopularity, it's why they chose the courts as their primary vehicle for the advancement of of this program, right? Because the courts are not democratically accountable. We don't elect them in, and we can't remove them. Um, and um, and because they're you know insulated by life tenure, there's nothing there's just nothing to do about them. So they they chose the courts as a, a a really important center of power to invest all these resources and to 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 build all this you know right. infrastructure. The, around. Their their only problem is they don't make the kind of money they would make in private practice. Um, it, and so they also Leonard Leo is the guy who's figured out how to solve that problem for them as well. Yeah, and that's we learned, going on a long time. This is what this is my point. It's like they're exactly in there. Right. They're yeah, in I mean, there. And, and, and the, the reporting yeah. from ProPublica that we saw just a couple of weeks ago that showed that, you know, actually Clarence Thomas was going around to Republican politicians telling them he was going to step down from the bench and that other, you know, justices were going to step down the bench from the bench unless they figured out their pay, you know. You know, right in right right before they started bringing in all of these you know extravagantly luxurious gifts and direct payments to Ginny Thomas through dark money groups, I mean the timing is is notable, but right yeah I mean so it it requires investment in kind of keeping these judges happy for sure, but you know to your to your question about what the agenda is I think you know it's it's really those things it's it's you know deregulatory and anti tax rulings for the billionaires, it's um, you know anti-black and anti-minority rulings um, for the, you know, the, the social, um, you know, the social motivations of the, of the American right, you know, going back to the, to the civil war and going back to Brown versus board of education, you know, originalism as a doctrinal project really emerged from the racist backlash to Brown versus board of education. Right. And then the final one, which has, I think, renewed emphasis and priority with Leonard Leo's increasing power and sway. Of course, he got a billion and a half dollars two years ago in the biggest dark money transaction in U.S. history. And the and the and what that did was not only supercharge this entire movement, but it brought this religious extremism that you touched on into the center of the agenda, because that's really what he cares about. Yeah. So no, what are we going to see? I guess what are we going to see? We're going to see is it separation of church and state that they're going after first? What are what are the things we're going to see come to the court that are going to advance this agenda? What are what are we looking at here? Yeah. I mean, I think the first thing I'd say What's in response domino? to the question is that, you know, we are we are not like we're we're in a continuum right now, right? This project is okay. fully underway. Right. We have to look at all of the things that have happened at this court, even before Trump was able to, you know, put his three justices on it as part of this project. So, like, you know, you could pick any point in time, but, a, you know, you could let's go to 2008, the Heller decision, creating out of whole cloth the individual right to bear arms. We talked about that on the last the right. last time. We were yeah. on, right. And Scalia's, you know, Horrifying. tipping off the, the outcome of that case to an NRA activist at a conference that he didn't disclose that he was sent to in Germany. Um, but, you know, Citizens United you know, flooding our system with dark money I, or with, with money in politics. I actually think, and I see that I'm frozen, but I'll keep talking. Keep talking. Uh, we can hear you. I always freeze in the worst possible. <laughs> I know. It's so good. It's the worst. I blame Leonard Leo. It's it's yeah. very side Leonard money. You know. yeah. Well, but this yeah. is like, let, let me just put, put a little thing around, a little wrapper around the Citizens United is, Again, it's probably it's something that was years in the making because they knew they were going to need to have this money to keep funding this project. Like they that, budgeted right. it out and said, I actually I actually think they had something else in mind. Oh, OK. I think, I think what they wanted to do, I think it was, they, it was fundamentally an anti-democratic maneuver okay. to reduce the power of the American people in having a say mm -hmm. in the outcome of our elections and to yeah. make money the predominant and ultimately the only coin of the realm in politics. And I think you can see the rot that this has caused, not just within the Republican Party, which has you know, been happily captured by Republican billionaire interests, but you can see it on the Democratic side too, wherein you know, Democratic politicians with the ever increasing cost of, of winning office have to take corporate money, which yeah. just naturally you know, diminishes their, in, their incentives and their ability to represent the people um, when they ultimately need to go back to corporate coffers to have any chance of, of staying in office. Sorry for my internet. No, I, okay. Oh, yeah. what can about, I, can I, let's can go, I, yeah. Go, 
Oh, I wanted to talk about Clarence Thomas for one second. Okay. okay? I, yeah. I don't want to change the subject, though. Do you want to? I just wanted to get into the separate. I, I was, I was going to say, you know, I, I just want I'll finish my thought just to say yeah. that, like, you know, they've been deciding these cases, advancing a far right economic and social agenda and ratcheting back the tools of democratic accountability through anti-democratic voting rights decisions, decisions on gerrymandering to set themselves up to, you know, be an entrenched minor, minority power insulated from popular pushback and accountability. And so now that they have that power, um, you know, it's a it's a little bit vulnerable. We talked about this too, but it's a little bit vulnerable because they don't have an army. They don't have the power of the purse to kind of see their orders be, you know, you know, um, you know, born out. But um, they do have quite a lot of power and we have sort of taken it lying down in terms of our acceptance of judicial supremacy. And so I think along all of these contours, we're going to see the law continue to move really aggressively to the right. It's the Andrew Jackson thing. The, the, the chief justice said that. Well, let's see him enforce it. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So it, I think it, that's a that's a that's a conversation that Americans need to be having right now in a, in a real way. And just to tie this back to Leonard Leo quickly, uh, you know, easy the to guy, do. Always easy. He, he, well, he's a fascist. That that I'm not saying he's in Opus Dei. I'm saying that the the Catholic Information Center that he's associated with is associated with Opus Dei. And that came out of fascist Spain. It's a, yeah. you know, it's inherently a fascist thing. And in order for them to get what they want, these rules, these, you know, the anti-abortion, the anti-contraception, the anti-gay, certainly anti-trans, all that stuff, people don't want that. The majority of people don't want that. Yeah. They need to set up minoritarian, what Bryn Tannehill, my guest on Prevail, has to be called minoritarian rule. And that's what they're doing. That's yeah. what they're doing to your point. And, you know, and that's why, and they baked up this entire fake body of ideas, doc, you know, they call yeah. them doctrines to justify them. And that's what makes the courts and the law such a dangerous weapon in a, you know, a broken democracy because, you know, normal citizens, everyday people don't have the tools to parse Supreme Court opinions and decide this is bullshit. Yeah. And so it's up to, frankly, the legal profession and the media to start, you know, really calling this stuff out Up the, the media game. is getting better but the legal profession is is you know pretty well captured by the by the you know institution yeah. by the institution and by their own inability just like what i was talking about just to actually come to terms with the fact that it's happening yeah you know because like, oh, I'm, no. sure, you know, I'm not sure about that i'm not sure about that you, you know when i when, when i talk to lawyers including progressive lawyers public interest lawyers yeah. that you know, represent really important stuff in the courts. Like yeah. they agree with me. They'll have this conversation with me in private. They'll just never say it in public because they can't, right? Because they're jeopardizing their clients, you know, chances of winning in whatever case they might have before these courts. Hmm. Well, that's good news though. I mean, it's at least they, <laughs> they're not crazy because yeah. some of these people are, they, they really do believe all this nonsense. You know, yeah, yeah, you, yeah. you've tangled with some of these people on Twitter. Uh, I will not call them out here, but uh, <laughs> you know, we, we know who they are. Um, so man, the Clarence Thomas thing, I, I just, th this new thing that came out, we talked about this briefly and I was, I was tabling it cause I wanted to ask you this, Alex, uh, he's on the court. He lets it be known that he ain't making enough money and he's going to leave during Clinton. So he's going to be replaced by, you know, not Clarence Thomas. Uh, <laughs> and then suddenly all this money comes in the rv and the this and the that and the i don't know wh whatever it is i mean i n nothing would surprise me now but greg is is the poor man not allowed to have friends are you saying he can't have friends <laughs> we should all have such friends i mean this but, is the, this is the best argument they've leveled is this, yeah you know, my but, friend. You know, and, and, and that is You're a good argument because yes they should be friends. able to have friends but this i think this piece this piece that he said that and floated that out there it's like a basketball player demanding a trade, you know. It's like that's what it, it's okay. Yeah. Demanding a trade, great. We're gonna tr trade a different team. Like, how the fuck is that not just flat out bribery? Yeah, it sure seems like quid pro, quid pro quo bribery yeah. to me. Pretty close. It, to it's it, it's it, like extortion. Not. I'm gonna quit unless you pay me. Yeah. How is that not illegal? Yeah. No. I mean, it's it's alarming. It's 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 unbelievable, frankly. And you know, as as. And it comes on the heels of, you know, it seem, seemingly weekly explosive revelations about Clarence Thomas's conflicts of interest, his, you know, his direct engagement with ideological billionaires at convenings where they talked about overturning things like the Chevron Doctrine, which is on the 
you know, the, 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 the court's docket this term, you know, in the face of, you know, really clear evidence that Jenny Thomas had an instrumental role in organizing yeah. and executing January 6th and his, you know, stubborn refusal to recuse himself from these cases in violation of federal law. You know, there's a federal statute that requires this stuff. And we're, we're really not seeing anything in terms of, you know, coordinated, orchestrated pushback from Democrats or from the Justice Department in the face of, you know, very clear evidence of law breaking by a very powerful person. So I think, yeah. you know, the whole situation really, you know, it, 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 it's a, it calls back, you know, all these questions about Trump facing the music when he was breaking mm -hmm. the law. And, yeah. you know, what, what does the rule of law mean if it doesn't apply across the board? Well, and I think, again, I come back to, maybe this is how we transition into our, into our next dude. Um, but <laughs> this is going to be good just, because I think you don't agree. I like yeah. this. No, no, I just, I, I can't <laughs> imagine that he's a one-off. Mm. Yeah, well, start the start not, the timer. We know he's, he's not, not a one-off. We, we know that Scalia engaged in exactly the same pattern of fraternization and free trips. I mean, Scalia really devised this scheme. I wrote a piece in Slate about how Scalia really mastered mm -hmm. art. People could look it up. Um, and then, yeah, we also have evidence that you know Alito is leaking the results of cases to religious activists. He's going on trips. You know, Politico had this explosive story about. Um, Amy Coney Barrett's connections and Alito's connections to these um, Catholic activists who are trying to, as you as you suggested, Stephanie, um, end the separation of church and state by creating a directly taxpayer funded religious school in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, it's I think it's it's definitely a, it's definitely a strategy. It's not coincidental. And Leo is the one that is you know spearheading it. Yeah. And yeah, so I, I just I want to talk a little bit about John Roberts, mm. the um, institutionalist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just, you know, I, I get, it's like, I, I'm, I feel like uh, people are gaslighting themselves, right. About him and about this court. It's like, Oh no, he wants to, he's not going to want it to be that way. And he's not going to want to go down in history of a blah, 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 blah. And Oh, he cares about the institution. It's like, what planet are you on? This is the guy that deep six the Kavanaugh stuff. Remember that? Mm. It came up to him, all these complaints and everything. He's like, oh, put that under. We got to get that guy in here because he, you know, I mean, come on. He's running this. He's not not in charge. Who's in charge? Ginny? Is Ginny fully in charge? Or is this guy? In, he's not ignorant. He's, he's very he's smart. not he's unaware. Smart if he is so obsessed with his legacy, then he's if that's the rap that we're going to, if that's the, okay, let's go with that. Well, yeah. then he would uh, be interested and very attuned to all of the accusations going around and all the evidence that's surfacing around the corruption within his own court. Yeah. Yeah. But he I doesn't mean, care about that. You really can't. Uh, you're totally right. Right. Like everybody has bought hook, line and sinker. Um, his projected image of a, you know, centrist institutionalist. Mm. And even as the courts and the court itself has gotten more and more extreme, um, that has only sort of somehow burnished his reputation as a centrist, you know, because it makes him look relatively less crazy when people like Sam Alito and Clarence mm. Thomas have gone way off the deep end or you have these Fifth Circuit judges that are doing really insane stuff. And, you know, I think if you look at his voting record and if you look at his record as a lawyer before he was a judge, he was one of those Reagan lawyers, one of those yeah. lawyers who Bush v. Gore. Yeah, he would. And right. He was on the Bush v. Gore team. He devised, you know, the Reagan administration's attacks on the Voting Rights Act. So you can see the through line in his career to, you know, cases like Shelby County or Brnovich, where he using his power as chief justice has taken a wrecking ball to democracy in America. Um, and then on, you know, the, some of the social and economic issues, I mean, ec on the economic stuff, he's one of the most pro corporate justices on the whole court. And then on the social stuff, I mean, he's very clearly on board. He wants to get to the same place as these other justices. He just has a different, different strategic sense. And I think a, a more shrewd one, right? He, he understands that overreach is going to result in, in, um, you know, a, a pushback and, a, you know, a, a big popular response, like we've seen in the wake of Dobbs. And so, you know, Roberts, to be sure, was going to get us to the result we got in Dobbs. It was just mm -hmm. going to be an incremental process. And yeah. I think that's kind of that's just his default mode. And it re works really well with the press. I think we're going to see it on, you know, really, um, you know, really bright display this year as the court navigates this 
really in increasingly complex and dangerous docket, which also gives it some huge opportunities for PR wins if it, say, strikes, you know, d d d says Trump is not immune in the other Trump case, or if it strikes down, um, you know, any of these lower court orders on, on abortion. They yeah, have to strike down that Trump's not immune. <laughs> Because if they don't, if Trump's not immune, then Biden's not immune, and Biden could just yeah, take it. What, what stops Biden from going on a killing spree? They clearly yeah, will, ridiculous. right? So you know they, they will do that, and then so like, what's the what's the coverage going to look like, and what can yeah. we do as like you know, you know, perceptive people that are paying attention and participating in this discourse to say like, no, no, you know, just because the court has this insane docket this term, it doesn't mean they're going to do the worst thing in every case. And if we set the expectation that it will, then that's going to result in more media coverage about this court being balanced and not so bad, mm. which is exactly what they want. It's interesting. Exactly what who the, wants? The court, the justices. Yeah. Right. The you, justices, think they they, want, yeah. you think they want to be called balanced and not so bad? You think yeah. they care? Yeah, because it's essential to there's their, um, to, to their own hiding. power in the longer term. Right. If, yeah. if, if, you know, if if the New York Times, you know, starts talking like I talk about the court as like fundamentally corrupted, you know, unprincipled in its reasoning, you know, they'll just start to lose their grip, grip on power. And other actors in our in our democracy will be more emboldened to push back on them. And when they do things like strike down Biden's student debt relief plan, they'll just say, no, this is this is bullshit. But why? Like, OK, I hear you saying that, but there's no consequences to them going ahead with their project and agenda. And we also know that at least one, if not two, and I would say probably John Roberts is making more than anybody, are being financially compensated in, in ways that they sleep quite well at night. Yeah. They have their, nothing's going to happen to them. They're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. They can, I think, I, I think, I'm not sure. I, I hear that, Alex. I just want everyone to brace themselves for like, these people don't care. Yeah. I, everyone thinks they care about so, that, what we care about. And they're, they don't. No, they certainly don't care about what we they care about. They don't care. No, no. They, they but care they, about power. They, they care about power, right? How and, are they going to lose power? Well, if Tell they, them how they would lose power. I mean, they they could lose power if there is a is if there's a popular revolt, right? Or if or and they also understand that you know people make voting decisions based on the court for for decades. Democrats have not prioritized the judiciary and have not and Democratic voters have not voted on this issue. But look at the right, you know, they they the you know Republican voters voted as single issue voters on abortion and the court uh, for decades, and that you know created a, a meaningful change in American politics but that and took so, 30 40 years and these yeah, guys but, aren't going to But they be were in, they, they weren't their positions weren't popular right yeah and, we're, we're you know, more we, popular it, people that yeah. agree with us are the, in the majority in this country and if we started to act like it then this court's power is tenuous i hear i hear you I, but i don't know where they're going if There's, especially if trump is reelected they're not going anywhere there's two ways. That, That's the, that the ticket to ride. Die. They're they're in then. They're in like Flynn forever. But they're not. They're, they're, the, the, they're going to be fine. They're going to help him. They're going to help him implement Project 2025, the Heritage Plan to dismantle yeah. the Amer the administrative state. That's yeah. right. That's their goal too. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If Trump is a dictator, they're going to lose power. I'm just saying that's what happens in Russia. That's what they try to do in Poland. Like that's what that's what dictators do. Yeah. They undermine the judiciary. It's the first thing they do. I mean, other than the the anti-Semitism and the, all the women stuff, yeah. but they they go after that because that's the power source. So you have that, and then you have, like Alex said, like the majority of people think that it's bullshit. It's like jaywalking in New York City. It's illegal to jaywalk, and it was sodomy was illegal in Texas until like three years ago. You know, the gay people can made out in Texas, and it happened because people decided that the law was bullshit. So if the Supreme Court says we're, 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 this is what this is the mistake Obama made, by the way, with the Merrick Garland thing, he should have said, hey, I order you after 90 days without a thing. I order you to the court and let yeah. them fucking play it out in court, like do something, take yeah. an active position on it, because that's what people want anyway. It's the right way. Yeah. The Senate's not supposed to, like, clog the muck up the works that way. So, yeah. well, here's what here's what's going to happen. Here's yeah. what we need. Because our timer went off, but and I want to be respectful of your night too, Alex. I know what you said. <laughs> but what we need then is for Al truly for Alex to come back and say, because I'm going to need that. I'm going to need to hear the consequences that they are aware of, because I don't think they fear popularity 
at all. At all. They don't care. I don't You don't think they want to be popular? You don't think Sam Alito want to be popular? I think they've I think they are they know they're popular with the people that give them money. And I think they know they're popular with the people that give them adulation that they that they want. And I think that Sam Alito to me is a true believer of like he really hates everybody that doesn't just worship already at his own altar. And so he doesn't care. No, I don't think he cares. I, don't I think, I think if it's he, cares. Media, if he, didn't like, care, he wouldn't be just so he's you know, sensitive with grievance. Right, right. They've got Fox News. They've got their they've got their media. They and their media is growing. And they, that media is reinforcing to them that they're that there's a bad guy out there and they're the good guys. And I, yeah, I think they're emotional infants and I, and it's like they'll just justify their grievance and that fuels them. That keeps yeah. them going. Yeah. So I you know, they're they're no I, I, I'm there I don't I don't get the the belief that there's something that's gonna somehow rein them in or fix them or keep them on their rails. I think we're past that point. So what when you come back, Alex, because I'm going ahead and book you, make sure you come back. I'd like to hear what some of those very real world things are other than us just uh, postulating about their um, inner emotional worlds and how they're going to react. Like what are yeah, some I'd real to, things? I'd love to do that. I'm, I'm working yeah. on some of those things. So I'd love to come tell you about them. Okay, Ooh, great. Yeah, yeah. can't wait for you to come back and share them. With Anytime them. you want to come, just let, you know, if you, got something, if you got something happening, let us know. You know okay. we'll, we'll work you in. We're, we're happy to, happy to do it. Um, Okay, we got it. We have announcements, and we move to the next topic. Can you hang, or do you got to? Yeah, to hang out. Sure, I got a little whiskey left, though. So. Oh, okay, I good. love it. Good, good, good. Cheers. Um, yeah, we call I, it. I got, the, I got this Cosmo <laughs> that's pre-made in the in the hotel. Like I, it's very oh. complicated to try to figure out how I was going to do so the cocktail sorry. in this hotel. Like I was going to maybe get one and bring it upstairs, but anyway, that's I'm sad saying. for you that you I had just, to have a pre-mixed. I, it's it's fine. It's it's okay. actually kind of good. So it's it's okay. <laughs> okay. Except it's empty, uh, which is the problem I'm having. Um, okay. So um, do we have any announcements? We're having the after hours. That's We're having question. an after hours. So Alex, what that is, is we have like a private version of this show, which really is just Greg and I sit around and talk about movies. This is what happens. But yeah. we'll talk about something more substantive. If you ever want to hang out with that, it's just more of a hangout um, right. that we do afterwards for the, for our, uh, the folks that actually... Uh, become members and subscribe and just to show our support of them because they support Very us. Cool. Yeah. But do you have, uh, so that's happening tonight, but do you have any uh, announcements, anything going on for you? Any pieces coming out, anything that you want to draw people's attention to anything that, very specific in the days ahead or no, or months even. No, nothing, nothing um, super specific. I will say um, one thing I'm going to be investing some time in, in the next couple of weeks is an effort to make sure that um, everybody knows that Clarence Thomas really needs to recuse from this case. Um, the Trump case, given yeah. Jenny Thomas's direct involvement in the underlying, you know, events um, that the case is about. It very squarely tees up um, his recusal obligation under federal statute, which demands a judge's recusal and a justice too. It applies equally to the to the justices of the court um, in any case where their impartiality might reasonably be questioned. And I think there's I've seen a lot of very reasonable people question this guy's impartiality. I like to think of myself as reasonable. I think sometimes that can be questioned, <laughs> but but um, you know I I think there's lots of really obvious ways um, to to require his recusal. I think there's a lot. That, in very, very few clear ways to um, ensure his recusal. So I think making a big issue of this, um, not only for for its own sake, to put pressure on him and to expose him as corrupt for his ultimate decision not to recuse, and he did not recuse from the certiorari decision to, to grant the case, um, mm. but to, um, to to highlight the the you know the la the systemic lack of accountability and ethics at the at the court and among federal judges is I think really critical and is a, a really important area for reform that that we're working to advance. But not that's probably not exactly what we're looking for. But that's what I'm that's what I'm really focused on. I love that if yeah, Roberts doesn't want to do that because it's up to Roberts, right? Whether or not it's up to Thomas under, I, you know, under. No, no, I mean, Thomas has to recuse, but in yeah. terms of the overall ethics that you're also trying to get the court to adopt yes. some of these rules that where there will be consequences and you will have to recuse. And there's yeah. some kind of rules other than just, well, these are our rules, but only if we feel like it on Tuesday, right? Exactly. 
Yeah. Um, and, and it's all up to us and no one has any oversight over us and all this stuff. So isn't Roberts the one who has to decide whether or not there actually is going to be oversight? Uh, yeah, he is. I mean, on some level, yes, that's right. He, he runs the judicial conference. He's, you know, which is responsible for investigating judicial misconduct. The, you know, the, the line from the courts is that that doesn't, that, you know, the judicial conference and the, the lower court code of conduct does not apply to the justices. All of the, the rules on the, the, the softer and weaker rules in the new toothless Supreme Court code of ethics are self-enforced. Just trust us. It'll be fine. Don't worry. You have no reason to think that we would ever do anything out of line. Gee, and <laughs> I wonder why I don't trust this guy. It's so yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I, he should call Max Max. I think Max Max. I think legal Max. Services does. Just tell yeah. us everything you know. Every little thing. And then thing ultimately, you know. as you know, as, as I said before, the Congress and the Attorney General of the United States have real, you know, obligations here to see that the federal laws enforced. Oh God. That's too depressing. Okay, moving on. <laughs> moving on. We're getting depressed. <laughs> but it, all right, that's it for our announcements. Here we go. <laughs> our last, our last thing. We gotta talk about Jeff. You you want to start talking about Jeff? So okay, so this Epstein thing, it just gets curiouser and curiouser, thought Alex. Uh Alex. Alice, right? That's the <laughs> <laughs> that's the book. Um, just don't put me on the list, work. okay? Just don't put me no, on the list. That's the, but I want to talk about it because I was thinking about it. Now, we, I, I don't, I really, I'm going to be surprised if there's any names or anything comes out that we don't know already. If there's a name on there that we haven't already heard, I will probably be surprised. I think if anything, we'll learn more details about stuff we already suspected and things will be confirmed or not confirmed or whatever. But I was thinking about like the level of, of this thing, of this game that he was running this op this whatever you want to call it what, what's the word for it i don't even know uh blackmail? yeah but it's not even just <laughs> one, one blackmail it's, it's an enterprise it's an endeavor it's a fucking corporation Industrial scale yeah. And, yeah yeah like okay now let's say it's a pre-2008 okay 2008 is when he you know went to jail and at that point there was no more uh you know saying you didn't know but pre-2008 you get a call from this guy. He has a nice house in, in the Upper East Side, very wealthy part of Manhattan. You're going to a party. There's all these fancy people at the party. I've never heard of this guy. I better vet him a little bit. Who does he know? Oh, Bill Clinton. Oh, the, the you know Prince Andrew. Oh, uh, people at Harvard. Oh, Stephen Hawking. You know, oh, Bill Gates. Like, and you think to yourself, I would imagine, if those guys are okay with this dude, he must be fine. So the amount of, and this isn't to, you know, get any, let anybody off easy. It's just the level of sophistication of, of the, the myth that he was building and how it is that one thing leads to the next thing leads to the next thing. And then you have this entire uh, mythology built up and all of these people that you would trust, you know, we, we try on Twitter, we were like, do we trust this person? Do we not? Do they seem legit or not? How yeah. do we know? You know, and we try to do our vetting process. It fucking it's Bill Clinton and Prince Andrew. Like that's those are real people, you know? Yeah. So that's uh, the ra most rarefied of rarefied air. Yeah. Right. So, so to get into that. And yeah. I think that however this, started, however it began, it begins with one little thing. And then these these brains, these people that know how to go, go. In Nexium, the cult Nexium, right? Keith Raniere, uh, who is the leader of that cult uh, in upstate New York, uh, was listed as he he did well on a test. It wasn't Mensa; it was like the next level Mensa thing. And somebody wrote an article about him in the local paper in Albany, saying that this guy was a super genius. And he took that thing and used it to promote every goddamn thing he did, all of the MLM stuff that he did. I'm a super genius. I'm this. I'm the, and Trump yeah. did the same thing with the I'm on the fortune or Forbes or whatever it was. I'm on the richest list of this thing. Oh, a banker is going to read Fortune fucking magazine and say, I guess this guy is OK. I guess he has money because Fortune magazine said he had money. You know, so there's this whole process with the vetting. There's a problem with the vetting. But um, I don't know. It's just a. It, that's what I, that's the, kind of the way that I've been thinking about it this week. I mean, Alex, how have you been thinking about it or have you been thinking about it? <laughs> I've been trying not to. Wise <laughs> <laughs> policy. As yeah. you were as you were uh, walking through that, I was like, you know, 
thinking about how it parallels the way the Supreme Court manipulates media. But um, but it doesn't, <laughs> not everything relates to the Supreme Court, it turns out. So I think that's probably just a straight dot. <laughs> well, okay. So on that note of what you were saying, I do think like banks, you know, they have a process. They actually have a vetting process and it's now very specific do. and there's accounting and you have to show us your money. Now they do. Yeah, yeah. So uh, those guys, you know, they they're, they choose to be in business with these crooks. So, you know, you know how I feel about bankers. Um, but like someone like I, you and I were talking earlier, this is not somebody I know. And it's certainly, you know, uh, she's got her fair share of scandals. But so someone like Naomi Campbell, who came forward again in these documents, um, just in terms of if you're a young girl, right? And... Jeffrey or Ghislaine is approaching you, probably Ghislaine or someone else, another young girl saying, oh, no, no, you can be a model, da, 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 da. And they have these, you know, you can, okay, you can see powerful men and you're, okay, powerful. This guy owns a modeling agency. If Naomi Campbell suddenly, the name and the face, no, he knows Naomi Campbell. For girls, especially in the 90s. Yeah. And that's the, so it's also that, that Epstein really specifically knew the brand value of the targets that he, the celebrities that he collected in terms of how that helped him with his targets, mm -hmm. right? And how that helped him with his blackmail schemes. So you want to have so, compromise a bunch of intellectuals um, and academics and especially scientists. You want to get investments in there. You want to get stuff. You got, he's got his, he had his weird fixations around all that. Well, guys, come to the island, Stephen Hawking is going to be there. What, you think they're not going to show up for that? Do you think anyone, it's like, imagine if Einstein was still alive. He's like, yeah, we're having this very secret conference of only the best and brightest minds, and you get to meet Einstein. Anybody you want to have access to is showing up for that shit. So it was also, it was about going that way. It wasn't just, it was about Jeffrey. It wasn't not just, you know, okay, I believe because I'm trust watched into this situation and he's trying to trust watch. It's he knew exactly who to have on his roster and to tout around to actually attract his victims, whoever they might be or hit whoever he was trying to exploit. That's what he knew. That's what he was. And Ghislaine were so good at. And it's she learned of, that from her dad. I it mean, sort of boggles the mind. I mean, they, they would have had to have like pretty high confidence that anybody they brought there was going to be like kind of solid, that they weren't going to get ratted out. And so, like, what was that vetting like? And like, mm. how, well, how this did is they, part, yeah, this is did the everybody that showed up there. Like, were they totally read in? To what was what was going down? No, I, and I think probably no. I, yeah, I think that's what I think. Just, like, felt like they couldn't come forward after it happened. Here's what I think everybody needs to remember as as they're like your son, your son, Greg, who's going on. Then people are going on social yeah. media and they're making. They think they're connecting dots, and oh, they're all part. They're all traffickers. Is that, you know. Psychopaths are incredible at compartmentalization. <laughs> and and that world, uh, that kind of rarefied air, if for someone like Naomi Campbell, go in her shoes now, right? She's showing up at a charity event, right? Or showing or going up to a thing, and and there's this guy, and he's with the president or with someone else, you know, and it's oh hi, you're just seeing him there. That world. It's just surface interaction, and, but you end up with a lot of name dropping, pictures, a lot of stuff. In that's just how that world works. It's not trafficking that, that trafficking that's happening there. It's a it's a again a bubble of rarefied air that's constantly being cured and and refined. Yeah. And you 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 have a life like Naomi Campbell. You're doing one of those. I don't know, several times a week, several times a month for sure. And you're popping from your private private Jane over here to this private thing over here. You're just going in this world. You're not, it doesn't mean you get to see what the fuck is going on or you're aware of it or you know anything about it. And the reason I'm kind of focusing on her and I can't find it now, I had it queued up, but it didn't, is she had a public statement that someone kind of made a meme out of that I think everybody should read. And it's like, we do not want to fall into a world by simply because you have a picture with someone or you are associate with someone or even a colleague of somebody, no matter how close that relationship, that their deeds that they do, your 
being accused of and held responsible for whether you had anything to do with it or not. Like that is a slippery slope. Talk about a slippery slope into fascism. That's it right there. And um, Twitter kind of builds its bones that way. I certainly, when I was doing research in organized crime and making all these connections, we you start there, but then, you know, everyone's got to up their sophistication game a little bit and say, yeah. okay, but what is this world like? And what is it like if you're someone in that world? How do you navigate it? And how does it navigate you? And once that context comes in, I think with the Epstein thing, it's very easy to then separate. All right. These are just the people who are <laughs> the world that he occupied that were sharing that world. And these are the people who he's actually committing crimes with. It becomes very clear. And the judges and their rulings of why they won't say, you know, we're going to go ahead and bring Bill Clinton on and subpoena him. It's like, I don't have a direct accusation about that guy. I'm not, I'm not trying to excuse Bill Clinton. I'm really not. Yeah. Um, I have my own theories about all that, but um, it, it gets important to actually then say, well, we're, it, evidence does matter. Witnesses do matter. The words that these girls, uh, that, that his victims have to say, right? Because they are the evidence when it comes to sex trafficking, actually know a little bit about this when, and I talked to some folks about this, but especially with children, the child, the victim is the evidence. Yeah. And what do you do when they run away? Or they, you know what I mean? This is like, or they, they end up addicted to drugs or they disappear somehow. Your evidence is gone. So these cases are really, really hard to bring forward and accusations should follow the evidence. It, it just should. Um, so when the girls are speaking and they're saying this happened and this happened and this happened and this happened, you have to, you have to start with believing them when it comes to the sex trafficking of, uh, especially of minors, even if it's decades later, because they are actually the evidence. There's no other evidence. That's the evidence. Yeah. I think this is a good point. And Alex, to your, to your point or your question about like, was everyone read in? This is, this is what I think. I, who the fuck knows? But um, when I was in uh, uh, early in my 20s, after I moved to New York City, I was living with my buddy, Chris, and he knew, he had friends from work that we used to hang out with. And, uh, you know, his good friend who led us into these nightclubs and stuff. And we were with them a lot. And she was doing cocaine the whole time. And she had other people that were doing cocaine. And Chris and I had no fucking idea that she was doing cocaine <laughs> because we don't do cocaine. You're we right. have no idea what's going on. We just didn't know. And she never offered it to us because she knew we would never fucking do it. So uh, it, it's very possible, I think, from this experience to, you know, my friend, uh, I had another friend who's a girl that she offered cocaine to, you know, maybe thinking, well, maybe. So I think that's probably what happened. They probably had little steps that they took. Do you want a massage? That's a, that's an introductory step. It's Olga. She's 50. You know, keep your underwear on, whatever. And then from there, they can they can kind of know, I, I, I would think. But, you know, I don't know. But to your point, LB, I think it's an important point. Just because somebody's on some list doesn't mean anything. I, just like I hate when people circulate the Maria Butina pictures with the politicians. And it's like, dude, politicians take pictures of everybody that asks. That I know, but I had a lot of fun with that one. Yeah, that, I the jokes yeah, you know were I mean. writing <laughs> themselves with that. <laughs> True. <laughs> don't you know. take away you can't leave that fun. material on the cutting room. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> Um, so we usually end the show uh, with a quote, right? Is that yeah, I mean, we usually say the same thing. We have an out. Are we going back to quotes? Did you find a I quote? No, I was going to see. I was going to see if, if Alex had a quote. Oh. Uh, you know, so, some kind of maybe some legal quote. Want to uh, take us out, uh, Alex? Yeah, but, 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 this has been a, a character flaw that I've identified in myself since a young person. I, I cannot retain quotes. I can't do it. I don't. Oh, you I, can't do movie lines. I can't remember jokes. I know I can do song lyrics, but I can't do oh. like pithy quotes, in poignant quotes, or jokes. I can't. I, if I, if you asked me to tell you a joke for my entire life, I couldn't probably tell you one. So I don't wow. think I, I could have prepared one, Greg. <laughs> no, no, I, I put you, and I, put, I apologize for putting you on the spot, but uh, we should also tell everybody, it's Alex, your last name is Aronson. 
uh, like A Ronson, like like Mark mm-hmm. Ronson, right? Was yeah, we lost an A. We lost an A to Ellis Island. And left left yeah. me with one A. Uh, so yeah, and uh, and that's that's your name, and uh, you're on the Twitter or the X or whatever the fuck it is these these days. You're fighting the good fight on there. Yeah, so anywhere else we can find you? Can we find you anywhere else? Nope, that's the place you can find me, pretty much. Okay. You can look at my. We we have a website, but it's incredibly rudimentary, and it will te- it will send you to a. Um, email address that you can reach out to if you want to learn more about our work. Um, courtaccountability.org. 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 Okay. Yeah, Fantastic. Go there. We will um, get you. We will survive. We, we yeah. will survive. Yeah. That's our out. <laughs> That's our out. Thanks for watching, everybody. Good night. Thanks, Alex, for Good coming night. on. We'll Excellent see you show. in the after hours. Yeah. <laughs>